Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled, I get revenge on my neighbor for destroying our family farm. Growing up, my family was always proud of the orchard my great-grandparents had planted over 120 years ago. The peach trees were our pride and joy, and every year, we threw a massive party when the peaches were ready to be harvested. It was a time to celebrate with friends and neighbors, and everyone looked forward to the event. But when Karen moved into the neighborhood after our beloved neighbor passed away, everything changed. Karen was an entitled, miserable woman who tried to ruin our family traditions. She demanded that we remove half of our trees and eventually tried to get the entire orchard removed. She even called the police on us and got our annual peach parties shut down. Despite her attempts to ruin our family traditions, we refused to cave into her demands. But things took a turn for the worse when Karen destroyed a 180-year-old building on our property, which was a historical landmark and played a vital role in a conflict back in the 1860s. To make matters worse, Karen built an illegal house on our property without our permission. This was the last straw for me, and I decided to take matters into my own hands. I did some investigations and found out that Karen hadn't applied for permission to tear down the old building or for permission to build a new one. I also discovered that her building was about three feet on our property. With all the evidence I gathered, I presented it to my parents, who initially didn't want to start a neighborhood clash. However, as time went on, Karen's behavior continued to escalate, and it became clear that we needed to take action. We contacted the authorities, and Karen was sued for tearing down a protected building and building an illegal house. She was forced to pay a hefty fine, demolish her newly built house, and rebuild the workshop on her own expense. However, this wasn't enough for me. I wanted Karen to experience the same pain she had caused us. So, I decided to buy her property and have her illegal house torn down. It was a satisfying feeling to see her house being destroyed, just like how she almost destroyed our family farm. But things didn't end there. Karen was angry and bitter after losing her property and went on a rampage. She started vandalizing our property and even threatened to harm our family. We tried to reason with her, but she wouldn't listen. We had no choice but to file a restraining order against her. Things were finally starting to calm down when one day, we woke up to find that our entire orchard had been destroyed. The peach trees were chopped down, and the land was barren. It was devastating to see our family heritage and tradition destroyed in such a cruel manner. We knew that Karen was behind it, but we had no evidence to prove it. We felt defeated and hopeless. However, we refused to give up. We decided to rebuild the orchard and start over again. It was a long and difficult process, but we managed to plant new peach trees and restore the orchard to its former glory. The new trees were stronger and healthier, and they produced more fruit than ever before. But we weren't going to let Karen get away with what she had done. We hired a private investigator to look into her past, and we discovered that she had a history of destroying properties and harassing neighbors. We used this information to file a lawsuit against her and Juan. Karen was forced to pay a massive amount in damages, and she was finally held accountable for her actions. She was also sentenced to community service and had to publicly apologize to our family and the entire neighborhood. In the end, justice was served, and our family farm was finally safe from Karen's wrath. We continued to throw our annual peach parties, and our relationship with our neighbors was stronger than ever. We learned that no matter how difficult things may seem, it's important to never give up and always stand up for what is right. The next story is titled, M Gets Her Way, Only For It To Backfire Spectacularly. This tale takes place decades ago, before the rise of the internet, before cell phones. Phones were in the process of shedding their tails so to speak. I was a girl fast approaching her double digits. Months earlier, my silent world had exploded into sound with the invention of a pair of tiny battery-powered devices that boosted sound called hearing aids. Before this, one made do wearing earpieces connected to a black box worn on the chest using a harness. These devices had a lot of issues and didn't work well with me. Too much feedback. I would much later make use of a similar system called an FM system during later school years. My 10th birthday was on the horizon. 
My parents surprised me by renting the party room of my favorite pizza restaurant where most of the staff knew sign language. The restaurant is set up with the party room in the back corner. On the opposite side is the arcade room. There's no door between the party room and arcade. This is important. Below these rooms was the standard restaurant floor. Booths lined the walls. The midsection was divided into two parts. The front part was sunken, much like a 70s area conversation pit. A central circular table held a fireplace while gaming systems lined the tables against the walls. NES, SNES, N64, Sega, Atari, and PlayStation. No Xbox as that would be released five years later, the section behind that was regular table and chair seating. Both sections were rentable for parties. We were setting up in the party room when Emma appeared. I saw her talking to my uncle and didn't think anything about it as I was in the process of studying my word list. At this point, I was learning to form my noises into words. I could make sounds, just not actual words. A light shoulder tap got my attention and my cousin signed that my uncle wanted my attention. I go to him. He signed that M wanted the party room and was offering to switch with us. I asked where her section was. It was the back section of the middle area, and I agreed to the switch. We switch, and I overhear M complaining about gang signs, and not being sure of switching for fear of violence, but EK wanted the party room. We switch. This puts us right next to the arcade. A bit later, I'm having my speech lesson with my dad. EK and friends try to dash through to get to the arcade is told he can't, and runs off crying to M. I'm on my dad's lap with one hand on my chest and my other on his, trying to mimic the same motions his chest makes as he says the words on my list. I'm struggling with a word. We hear a screech. M is pointing at us and screeching about sex, our use of gang signs, and how her husband was going to arrest us all when his backup arrived. My uncle stood. Now he's a huge beefcake of a man who is a big teddy bear inside. He towers well over her and glares at her. His mouth is moving. I later learned he was telling her I was deaf, learning to speak, and the language was signed language, not gang signs, and no, her spawn and friends were not going to disrupt our party. They can go around us instead. He didn't care it was too far, and EK was not unable to walk the distance. At that, red and blue lights start flashing outside and M looks smug. Cops rush in. Her face as my uncle greeted them was priceless. My uncle was the police chief. He told M she had a choice. Either she could wear a pair of silver bracelets and stay a night in five-star lodgings, or she could explain to EK he can't disrupt our party and has to walk around us to get to the arcade while leaving us alone. The cops are dispersed, and my uncle gives an assignment to Pete and Jim, fake names, to stay. It's a good thing he did. M ended up earning herself a pair of shiny silver bracelets and a night in five-star lodgings. First EK and friends destroyed the salad bar. Next, he tried to make off with the N64, then nearly succeeded with the PlayStation. He also got caught trying to steal my new Hot Wheels garage play set twice. I think I overheard her calling me a retard and asking why I wasn't in a home yet. The stereotype was finally starting to fall. M tried to skip out on paying for the party room in which she actually never bought the party package. Husband wasn't even a cop. He ran the evidence lock-up area. This was over 27 years ago, and it's fuzzy. I will answer any questions to the best of my ability. The next story is titled. Family takes seats at theater. So, I witnessed this years ago and have been dying to post it somewhere because I always felt like the conclusion was so satisfying it was worth sharing. So, me and my friend went to see a play at a small theater, Beauty and the Beast. Loads of fun. We got the tickets late so ended up at the absolute tippity top of the place, but right next to the bar so no problem. During intermission, my friend went to the bar, and I stayed to watch our seats, this section is not assigned seating. So, I'm looking back over my shoulder in anticipation of her coming back, when I see a family of four approach four kinda empty seats. I only say kinda empty cause the previous occupants had left their jackets over their chairs to reserve them. This isn't a rule, but where I'm from, it is generally respected, if there's a coat on the chair it's occupied, find another. This family however decided to ignore etiquette and gathered up the other family's belongings and dumped them on an empty chair in the row in front. So now I'm glued to this, how are next family going to react? I wasn't close enough to hear anything, but the previous occupants came back, another family of four, and things get heated. I could see the parents of newly seated family pointing aggressively and their mouths moving fast. They're not giving the seats up. 
so non-seated family walk away and come back a moment later with a member of staff. I'm thinking, uh oh, shit's about to go down. But the family and the staff member walk right past the seated family. They keep walking and disappear out another door, only to reappear a few seconds later inside one of those fancy boxes that sit right next to the stage, the ones that usually seat famous, important people. I look back to entitled family, the mood is visibly ruined. I'm just sitting there buzzing off the contact high of witnessing such a satisfying moment of karma. The last story is titled, I had a member of staff, M, try to force himself onto another staff member, F, she chose not to press charges. That didn't sit right with me. To preface I live in a country that employs a large foreign, expat workforce, in pretty much every industry and in all levels. For someone to move here for work they have to be sponsored by a company or the individual that's employing them. I own and operate a small restaurant business here and employ more than a handful of foreigners as servers, cleaners, kitchen staff, drivers, etc. So, here's the story. I was lounging on my couch enjoying the last of my weekend one day when I get a call from telling me that one of our sponsored employees, a server, let's call her Janice, was picked up for indecent exposure essentially. Long story short she was caught hooking up with a guy in a private booth at a local restaurant. Basically, the police walked in on them whilst engaged in some seriously heavy petting. They were fully clothed but the guy she was with, or practically on top of I should say, has his junk out. Turns out he works at the restaurant two doors down from where she worked. After a bit of chastising and threatening to escalate the situation and have them deported to sufficiently scare their senses back into them they let them go but not before signing a pledge-type document promising to never repeat the offense, or else, a slap on the wrist basically and everyone got to go home, but it doesn't end there. That night something clicked in my brain, and I had the thought, how and why did the police find them in a private booth in the back of a restaurant before the restaurant's own staff did? So, I called the restaurant the next day, I thought maybe they called the police on them immediately for some reason. Or maybe the couple got belligerent when staff asked him to stop, turns out the staff didn't notice a thing. In fact, up until that day the police have never been to that restaurant before, and when they did, they simply walked in, went straight to the back booths where the two were sat and busted right in. I realized this meant that someone must have seen them and called the cops on them point blank, the question was who? I decided to speak to Janice. I wanted to speak to her anyway that day both to check in and get her version of the situation. I also gave her the employer, you know you did something stupid, chat and reassure her that she's keeping her job. I also wanted to ask her who she thought called her in, without hesitation she said it had to be Sammy, who was one of our drivers. Why do you think it was Sammy? I asked, he's the one that dropped me off at the restaurant that day. He might have seen my friend walk in right after me and called the police on us. She said, well, that sounds a bit drastic, why would he do that even if he had seen you do anything? I asked, she claimed it was because he was jealous. He was really into her apparently and kept trying to get her into bed she said. What genuinely pissed me off was when she told me that he actually tried to force himself on her once and she fought him off and that he hasn't tried or even said anything since other than be very short and curt with her. My immediate response was, why on earth would you not tell me or one of your managers right away? She said she had dealt with it, her way, and it stopped, plus she didn't want anybody to get fired on her account and she didn't want any interaction with the authorities, so she decided not to make a big deal out of it in the first place. She also declined to press formal charges against him, which I advised her to do. Her declining infuriated me even more. This guy was going to get off scot-free. Now clearly, I was about to fire Sammy but in my mind that wasn't enough. For someone to attempt to rape a person basically and not get in trouble for it. Not okay with me. But it seemed like it was something I had to live with. Obviously, my next conversation of the day was with Sammy. My intent was to confront him with the accusations. I called him into my office. I didn't really know where to start so I went with, obviously you've heard about what happened to Janice this weekend. He stepped in it right away. Heard about it? Came the unexpectedly proud response from a proud AF and positively beaming Sammy, I called it in. And this is where it started to get super satisfying. You see for a couple of years since I met Sammy every now and then he would pull out and show us all pictures of his wife, who was back home living with his mother. She was younger than him and quite beautiful, but sadly barren, which is apparently why she settled with an older fart like him. He was so proud of how pretty she was. He was also a devout religious man, or so he claimed. 
So, I ask, and why call the police? He came back with, after I dropped her off. I waited to see who she was meeting because she's a troublemaker woman. When I saw the man walk in after her, I call police because I know him, and he is married, and this is against the laws of God and man. I'm smiling now, I knew I got him. Why do that instead of calling your direct manager, or even me, and before even seeing for yourself what they were doing exactly at that? Why make it my problem and the company's problem what she does in her own time? Silence. Head down counting his shoes. Sammy, I know why. I know what you did. Janice just told me. I'm disgusted by you and sorry that we hired you. He had the audacity to mumble, I only tried once sir. I almost slapped him. Anyways I fired him, handed him a one-way ticket home, which was in four hours and told him to GTFO. This is where I get my not-so-petty revenge. I had his house phone number saved somewhere from we hired him. It was on his CV. I knew that because I called him there to interview him before we first hired him. I waited until his flight took off and dialed the number. I assumed either his mother or wife would answer the call, but I was wishing for the latter. I got my wish. Hello Mrs. Sammy. I'm your husband's employer. Well, his former employer anyway. Just so you know I fired him a few hours ago and he's on a flight home as we speak. His flight number is XX. He will be arriving at XX. Just so you are aware I was forced to fire him because he attempted to rape a fellow employee half his age. I'm sorry. I said, and promptly hung up, but not before hearing her gasping in shock. Thank you for listening.